if you don't dive into the why or valuing this kid or caring for this kid, it's easy that they can get sit in your program for one year, then two years, then three years, then four years. And so if you don't care about their ability to go be successful or to transition to the next stage of their life, we're going to have stagnant kids. They're going to be sitting in our programs. They're not going to be successful. If you don't care about our kids, they're going to discharge and do whatever it is that thing is that got him here. They're going to come back. And so our success is contingent upon their ability to stay in the community, not come back to these villages. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Stronger Than You Think a podcast by Youth Villages, and I'm your host, Sam Coates. In each episode, you'll hear a story of passion and resilience from an employee of Youth Villages, one of the top children's behavioral and mental health organizations in the country. Children with emotional and behavioral challenges and their families face unimaginably difficult circumstances, and it takes a committed, well-trained, and supported person to show up for these children and youth every day to help them find their path to well-being. Join us to hear from individuals as those on the front lines of this work as they talk about their career journeys and how their own personal experiences fuel their passion, making a difference every day. Our guest today is Whitney Malone. After playing college basketball and looking for a recreation therapy position, Whitney moved from the Chicago area back home to Memphis to take a job at Youth Villages. As you'll hear in this episode, her strong family support and upbringing have shaped her desire to spend her career serving kids and families here at the residential program in Memphis, Tennessee. Before we get going at Youth Villages, there are several different programs that each guest may reference. Youth Village's residential programs help girls and boys ages 6 through 17 with serious emotional, mental, and behavioral issues on campuses in Tennessee and Georgia. Our goal is to provide specialized therapy and support so that youth can overcome challenges and go home or to less restrictive care as quickly as possible. Now, let's get to this week's episode. Whitney, great to see you. Good to see you. What's it feel like at this point in your life to be an occupational therapist, but to be directing your work and your craft to the kids at Bill's Place versus all the other ways that occupational therapists can serve the community and and work, you know, whichever city they're at? I think kids are our future. And so when my parents said that a long time ago, I didn't know what they meant. (laughs) But I think now I do. And so... Being able to impact not only them physically, but obviously we're here at Youth Village's mental health facility. So I'm impacting them physically, mentally, emotionally in every capacity in the most holistic way. And so whatever they need, whatever their plan says, I'm targeting those goals, but I also get to connect with them a lot deeper and impact their ability to reintegrate into the community. What were your parents like? You said they said... Kids are the future. Yeah, my mom and my dad were pillars in my life. So I do believe we've gone through a pandemic, right? And so I have a friend group, and we talk a lot about, like, things that happen in the world, things that happen in life. And so throughout the pandemic, a lot of things have happened. So whether that's people losing their jobs, their homes, their family members, we've had the luxury to not lose. And so Youth Villages has been a really, really big part of that. And so growing up— My parents were pillars, and when we were impacted, things such as COVID or recession or inflation and all the things that happened in the world, my parents stayed steady. It was never—I never missed anything. I didn't miss a meal. I didn't miss, you know, being able to go out and get in toys in Christmas. Like, I just didn't miss. And every game, achievement, award ceremony, they were there. And so— they would always talk about how they would pour into people. Like, hey, when you got to pour into people. Like, we're pouring into you. Remember, you know, when you get older, this may be you one day. And now it's me. Now it's me today to be able to pour into the next person and connect with the next person and influence kind of how they go out and impact the world. And so they would always say, make it be a good ripple. Like, your ripple needs to kind of touch, but it needs to be, not to be a wave and don't drown anybody. But... It needs to ripple and touch somebody to where you can impact their life. So my parents were my pillars. Do you have siblings? 
I have a whole lot of them. <laughs> I do. How many? So I have two older brothers, a younger brother, a younger sister. So I'm right smack in the middle. Okay. So five total. Total. Okay. Has their life been similar to yours? So yes and no. I call myself the unicorn because I do think that I'm a little bit different than my siblings. Um, my older sister went on the trajectory that she wants to. She's a guidance counselor. My older brother had went to he went to prison for a while. We went to visit him in prison, and he's doing better. But he's I wouldn't if I my definition. So nobody else's definition of successful. I would say that he is successful on his terms, but not something that I would ever want to experience myself. And then the brother that is the closest to me, we're about a year and a half apart. He is a basketball coach, and he coaches young people. And so my younger brother and younger sister are (laughs) a bit challenging. So do I think that we all were raised under the same roof to an extent? Yes. But why we went our different ways or why we, you know, had different walks of life I'm not really sure. That's a lot kind of what we talk about, like, you know, what makes us different. And I think it's what's already in you, too, is what people put into you and how you use that and how you allow that to motivate you. And so you can see something not go right and see something not go the way that you intend or what you see your future. And you can either do something about it or you can do something about it and fall in line and let that be exactly who you are. And I chose to be the unicorn. So... Your parents, you talked about your parents were at every game. You mm-hmm. never missed a meal. Mm-mm. They told you to be a ripple. Be a ripple. Mm-hmm. I mean, just briefly, if you're open to sharing, what they do? So my dad was a cable guy, and he had a nickname, Big O. <laughs> every, and his name is Oliver. Everybody knows my dad. There's nobody. He never met a stranger. He never met anybody that he couldn't have a conversation with. And when a lot of people saw me, oh, you big girl's baby girl. And I'm like, yeah. And so his ability to connect and be personable and be friendly and be like this community person, like that's my dad. I knew, everybody knew whether or not my dad was at my game. I knew whether or not he was at a game you or not. Hear him. So not even that I couldn't hear them, but if my shot was off or anything, I, w- I always looked for him before the game start because that's who taught me the game. Like his love for the game rolled into me and my brother. And so when he's not, when he's not there, I'm like, I need someone to help me fix my shot. So he's watching, you know, my game for me to be able to make those. And yes, I have a coach. So I'm not saying that I didn't respond well to my coach, but my dad was my personal coach. He knew, you know, if my elbow wasn't tucked or if I need to flick my wrist or if I need to, you know, move my feet. Am I tired? I need a little pep in my step. Like he was that sideline person and he always had this little sound when it was like this really huge play. And you guys heard of the Thundercats? Uh uh-uh. uh. Okay, so Thundercats. I might were, be the wrong person. To and that's ask, okay. But. So, like, if you ever watch Thundercats, they say it like three times and then it's like this really big sound at the end. And so he would always make that really big <laughs> sound on a really, pl- like, big play. And so I always knew, like, he was there. And so they're like, oh, that's Big O. I'm like, yeah, that's Big O. And so, yeah, he was. He was that community person. And my mom worked for the Naval. She still does. But she works for the Naval base. And so she works for the Navy. Are they former military? So she's actually a civilian. And so she's been in the uh, civilian, since I can remember, over 30 years. And so. Yeah. The reason I asked, it just sounds like they created a very stable environment for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were involved in your life. They were very supportive. Yep. And there's a sense of pride. Yes. The way you talk about them. Yep. Is that fair? Very much so. My mom is like my best friend. She always said growing up, I am not your friend. She is now. Yeah. So obviously I needed a mother. Because she did growing it right. Up. Yeah. But now I talk to her probably every other day and all of my big things, small things. And she said yesterday, we were on the phone yesterday, I was just telling her kind of where I was and that I was doing this. And she was like, hey, I'm glad that you go get what you want. I was like, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, she mm-hmm. believes in you. She does. And always pushing you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, but awesome. not even if she didn't push me, is her being okay with the decisions, being proud of my own decisions, but then making it okay for me to dream one, but then chase my dream. So she's never confined me. Stay here. Don't stay here. Go. And so whatever it is that I wanted to chase, she was always okay with me chasing that dream. It's really cool being in this in my chair because hear from somebody like yourself 
who was given this experience, mm-hmm. was given this comfort and security yeah. from a family standpoint, this pride, this confidence and where you come from and what you're doing. And, and then you're given that to children and families now. And then it's also like the person before you, they didn't have what you had, but they're focused now on giving people, you know, what you had mm-hmm. and what out of their health and, you know, resiliency and maturity today, they're just trying to go back and help people with what they needed back then. Yeah. And so it's, it's really eye-opening to hear how people like you with your experience and the people that didn't have what you had mm-hmm. are just motivated and driven to do the same thing. Yeah. When did you know you were going to play college basketball? My whole life. Really? Yeah. Were you just good? Yep. Growing up? I was great. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not really quite the, the bragger, but yeah, I did know. I, I knew that I've always known that my life is more. I've always known that I want it more. And so as a little kid, my brother and I used to play against each other. And so— You had that edge. I did, just a bit. But it's, I think it's because of my brother and my dad. Because he, we used to play against each other, and he would beat me. Play, we'll play, he'll beat me. We'll play, he'll beat me. And so this one day that I remember very vividly, we were outside at the house, and we played, and he beat me. And my, and my dad came to play him. And so that what would happen. We'll play. He'll beat me. My dad plays. My dad beats him. This time, my dad didn't beat him. And so my dad said, you have to win on your own. And I was like, okay. So we played again, and I won. And beat I him like, twice. I was so happy. <laughs> yeah. But ever since then, I guess I knew, like, I wanted it. Is there any connection to the, what you just shared, being a woman in heaven, a strong career and having autonomy and and building what you're doing now. Yes. That's, yeah, I I guess I never connected that moment and that, that to now, but yeah, like being able to financially be on my own, mentally be on my own career, make my own path or, and not saying that people didn't help me get here. So I would be remiss to say that no one ever helped me in life to be successful, but I also do think that you have to have that motivation and that drive to get to where you're going. And so, yeah, to be a woman and to stand on my own two feet and to have my own voice, yeah, I 100% value that. I 100% believe that I am successful because I had to do it on my own to an extent. Like, I had to have that drive myself. So, yeah. And your dad and mom, they helped, they wanted you to see that early on. So I, I'm sh- my mom for sure. So my dad, I'm not going to say that he didn't, but I guess, yeah, I didn't think, again, I didn't really think of it like that, but he made me do it myself. If you want to win, you got to beat him. And I was like, okay. But my mom for sure, she always said that she wanted me to be able to rely on nobody but me if I had to. So, hey, Whitney, I'm not going to always be here forever. Your dad's not going to be for he- here forever. So can you do it on your own? And that is 100% how she raised me as a woman. And not saying that, you know, marriage and all those things are not, you know, okay or that you can't. But in the event that something happens and you have to make it work, can you make it work? And I have made it work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw that you played at two different colleges. I did. Correct. Mm -hmm. Was it Tennessee? Tennessee Martin. Okay. UT Martin. Mm Mm-hmm. And then Southwest Baptist. University. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's within a four-year period. Correct. And you've been at Youth Villages for 11 years. I have. (laughs) And I think the average for, give or take, for somebody up to 40, might be two and a half years, average time. Mm -hmm. And then for, give or take, I need some grace here on on the data, but, you know, somebody 40 to 50, it's about five years. Yep. So how have you been able... So far, since your first job out of college, mm-hmm. what's kept you here for 11 years and counting? Youth Villages is, it's not an organization. So it's just say Youth Villages family. <laughs> and so internally, that is how we communicate. And externally, everybody sees us, I know it's Youth Villages and, you know, we're an organization and a nonprofit and all that. But internally, we really are a family. And I think people work for people and with people not for an organization. The organization is essentially the house that holds everybody inside of it, so to speak. And I've been here this long because of the people that I've been able to come in contact with. And so 
not only are they good people, are they genuine, do they value me as a person, but they value my ability to be professional. They value my professional growth. And so I always say that if you are under the right people and you're intentional about your professional development, you literally can go work anywhere. And so I've been here that long because I'm always growing. So once I outgrow a position, I'm ready for the next and I'm ready for the next and I'm ready for the next. Or let's say it's not a position. Still train me. Train me to take your spot. And most of them do. They train me to be who they are. And so we have one really phenomenal leader here and says to dress for the position that you want, not the position that you're in. And so they train you to do just that. And so the family aspect, the professional development, still here. What's the benefit of this? Because, you know, it's common in the marketplace right now Mm -hmm. from a publication standpoint, from a data standpoint, you know, the benefits of remote work, of flexibility from a career standpoint. Mm -hmm. Maybe not everybody has to be a W-2 freelancer. But what you're saying is community is wisdom, relationships, Mm -hmm. people that are one, two, three, four steps ahead of where you're at. Mm -hmm. And then there's also autonomy, responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear from your tone of voice, just that if you come in, you work hard, you do the right things, you trust the right people, you're just going to keep developing your life and your own skill sets. For sure. Did I understand you correctly? Yes, you did. So all of that comes with your your ability to perform. So I have independence, I have flexibility, and I have less oversight. So I'm not even, I'm under the house and I'm under the roof of youth villages and I'm under the roof of my supervisor. But because I'm able to perform because of the trust, I have the autonomy I have the flexibility. If I need to not be at work today because, you know, my mom has a doctor's appointment, I'm not coming to work, and that they're okay with that. But when I come to work, they're going to get 100% from Whitney. It's not a question about it. It's not let me think about it. You know, is she going to do what she needs to do? And so you have that flexibility, that autonomy that you're looking for right here. But it also starts with your passion, your drive to work with this population, with these kiddos. And even if you don't work directly with them, because we have recruiting and business and finance and still their job directly impacts the people that we serve and our customers, which is the kids. And so their ability to balance our fiscal year. So they have to make sure that we have enough money in those facilities, in those programs, in their projects to impact the kids. Recruiting has to make sure that we have enough staff to staff the programs to impact those kids. And so you have that here as long as you're you're able to perform. So that's not something that goes missing because now I have to work in a brick and mortar or because I have supervisors and I or I have to get up and come in every day. You get up and you come in every day and you do your job and you do it well, those things are rewarded to you. And that's the luxury about working for youth villages. We value our people. It's not just a box and we, we don't serve boxes. You don't pick it up, put it down, move on. We serve children. And so, and we serve people. So our customer, yes, there are kiddos, but our customers are our staff. So we want you to feel valued, appreciated so that you can then reciprocate that to our kids. Was it that way 11 years ago when you started? Yep. So you felt that then? I did. You know what blows my mind? I, how do you start something with what? Less than 10 staff? Yep. And build something that's not stopping to 3,600. Yep. And through its challenges and adversity or areas that it needs to improve, but you build a culture that strong. Yeah. He, so, and I interact with him quite often, which is Pat, our CEO. If you ever meet him and ever run into him, you won't know he's the CEO unless someone specifically tells you. Someone has to say, hey, that's Pat. <laughs> like, hey, that's our CEO. He's very personable, very friendly welcoming, but he's also intentional. So he's very meticulous about what it is that he's trying to accomplish. This is our goal. Let's meet it, but let's meet it doing it together. And he's not going to ever make you feel like what you're doing, whether it's a big ripple, small ripple, small piece, large piece, that it's invalued. So he's val- he values everybody. And I know I say little old me, but every time he sees me, 
I get a hug. How you doing? You're doing great. I'm really proud of you. He knew that I went back to school. He knew that, hey, I could have potentially went a different direction in leadership, but I chose not to. He was okay with that. He wasn't disappointed that, you know, I didn't transition into a role of, a, you know, being a different kind of leader. It was, hey, I support you. Let's go for it. And every time he sees me, hey, I'm proud of you. So he's also intentional about the value of the people that work in his organization to be intentional and say, hey, I'm proud of you. So we believe in him. He makes sure that we believe in what he's trying to do and where he's going. And we get on the bandwagon and we rock with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it feel like playing basketball again? No, not (laughs) quite. Sometimes I, you know, coaching basketball makes me feel like, oh, I really want to do this all over again. But it's a different kind of thrill, but I do, it is a thrill and it is a, a great ride to be on because I do work with incredible people, but, you know, basketball is my first love, so I don't think ever, anything will you can't feel like that. can't lose your first love. Yeah, no. <laughs> but the competitiveness, the momentum, the routine, the energy. Yeah. Is there any similarity there or no? To an extent, I would say the competitiveness, not necessarily because even though, We're essentially competing against ourselves. I know that may have sounded a bit cocky, but we have something called core indicators. And in these core indicators, it's us keeping our own scoreboard, keeping our own points to see how successful we are from month to month, from year to year, you know, and day to day. And so in those goals, we're competing against ourselves to say, hey, we did this this month, so next month let's do better. The month after that, let's get better. The month after that, let's get better. And so to an extent, yes. So maybe not necessarily with other organizations, but internal competition, for sure. Like as a program manager, I definitely, it's like, hey, I want program manager. I want to be the program of the month. Like let's make sure that all of our data, our successes, our wins, our you know, all of the things in supporting these kiddos are like good so that we can get the little sign outside and say, hey, we're the program of the <laughs> of yeah, the yeah. quarter. So for sure, to an extent, yeah. Okay. So it's kind of how you approach your work. Yes. How you measure yourself mm-hmm. over time. Yep. You talked earlier about you couldn't do this work if you didn't take care of the kids. Mm-hmm. How did that get instilled in you? Because your upbringing, you know, was strong. When I had a kiddo in my cottage that had been there for over a year. She had nowhere to go. And typically, I make really good connections with my kids, with my staff. But then this particular case, like, pushed me as a leader to, like, really jump into, like, this kiddo's past, like, in its entirety, like, the whole case. And if you don't dive into the why or valuing this kid or caring for this kid, it's easy that they can get sit in your program for one year, then two year, then three years, then four years. And so if you don't care about their ability to go be successful or to transition to the next stage of their life, we're going to have stagnant kids. They're going to be sitting in our programs. They're not going to be successful. If you don't care about our kids, they're going to discharge and do whatever it is that thing is that got him here. They're going to come back. And so... Our success is contingent upon their ability to stay in the community, not come back to these villages. And so twofold, you have to care, one, about that person, that being that you're impacting. But then two, I mean, are you going to care about yourself? Are you going to care about your ability to have pride in something that you're doing, have pride in the human that you are, you know, on this planet to say, like, hey, I impacted somebody today and go be a good person to somebody else. So I definitely do not think that if you are not, if the kid isn't the main goal, if our the children that we serve isn't the main goal, this may not be the place for you, for sure. Because then you get complacent. You get complacent, you get stagnant, you look at them as a box instead of as a person. You're just looking at, oh, it's just another kid, you know, oh, they're going to go back out and, you know, but don't realize that those kids impact us in the community. So if this kid is you know, stealing and fighting and shooting. And you could have been that person that they shot at the gas station. You could be the person at the grocery store that they stole from. But you also have the ability to impact that. Hey, let's make good decisions. Why are you making? Why are you stealing in the first place? Because when I go home, I don't have anything to eat. I'm by myself because my granny dot, 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 right? And so you have to be, you have to want to help that. You have to want to impact that directly. Up to this point, 
I haven't heard somebody frame it the way that you framed it about the urgency, the tempo, from a standpoint of the kid staying, the child staying in the system. Mm -hmm. I've heard the tempo and the urgency being shared through other ways that are very important. Mm -hmm. But honestly, like when you said that, my heart sank a little bit because I'm thinking about with what little I know, and I've dug in as hard as I can, but think about all the kids across the country. Yep. And think about any complacency or any indifference. And what you're saying is once you fully understand the gravity of that, yes. and you had that experience with that one kid, you realize that you've got to put the kid first mm-hmm. and you've got to do whatever it takes to understand that kid, go two, three, four layers deep. Mm-hmm. And then you also have to have pride in what you do as a human being. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have that, you're not going to be effective. Mm-mm. Is that fair? That's 100% fair. Yep. That's powerful. How'd you find you, Theologists? I was looking for a rec therapy position. <laughs> really? Yeah, and I was coming. I was doing my internship in Waukegan, which is right outside of Chicago. And I really was just looking for a position after I graduated. I'm like, oh, you know, I don't really know where I'm going to land. And I saw the position, and I applied for it, and I'm here. I didn't think that I—and I'm not really a homebody— and I didn't think that I was going to come back home because, you know, being You don't a, seem like a homebody. No. Like, you know, I've traveled for so much with basketball and, you know, my internship was, you know, outside of Chicago. Like, I like to not be home. <laughs> but this this brought me home. Yep. So I've been here since. And so I started as a rec therapist at Youth Villages. How have you seen resiliency play out through your own career? So I call it my worst 45 days. <laughs> when was that? So I was a program manager at our Dogwood campus. I had just transitioned from, which is now Bill's Place, but it was called um, our B-Cert campus. And I transitioned from a program manager from B-Cert, now Bill's Place, to Dogwood. And two different layouts in terms of, like, how the campus is laid out, staffing ratio. So same program, per se, Youth Villages, but just different details. And so I... Became a program manager at the Dogwood campus and inherited a group of staff. And so, which is always a bit challenging. So, one, I didn't come from that campus. And then you inherit a group of people that was trained, developed by, like, a completely different person, right? And so you kind of got some mountains to climb because you have to build relationship, build trust. They have to believe in you as a leader. So if they don't really believe in you, they're like, what is this person, you know, doing? And so coming over... The dynamics are very different. And so being a new program manager, it was more so making sure that this doesn't happen, right? Years later, I know that it was, it's more so we're being proactive, not being reactive. So I was waiting for things to happen so that I could respond and make sure that it goes back to normal. You don't want to rock the boat, is that what you're saying? No, I'm actually, so I was not being proactive. I wasn't preparing to make sure those things didn't happen. Right, that's what I'm saying. You, oh, okay. You weren't trying to maybe lead the way that, you weren't leading the way that you could have been. Correct. To get ahead of things. Yep. And so that was, in my development, that was like a really big concern because I'm like, nothing's happening. Like, I'm, you know, very green, very naive. And like, it's fine. Like, nothing's happening. Yeah, but I need you to like lead to see things happening when you're like, I need you to prepare to start seeing things, you know, kind of play out based off of things not happening. And so my schedule got changed. It was probably one of the worst things. So as a program manager, you typically work 10 to 6, 11 to 7-ish, you know, depending on what that dynamic looks like. And I had to work essentially the majority of that time, just because I was down staff, my program was, a lot of stuff was happening, like kids were fighting, kids were on restraints. And so with changing my schedule, I had to essentially be in my program, in there, like fixing the things, making sure that things. working more than. Than normal. 12 hours a day. Correct, probably. And so in those 45 days, I, and the, (laughs) She won't be mad because I've told her this story myself. I told her my internal story. So you have things that are happening on the outside that other people see, but then you really have a story that's actually happening on the inside of you, like what your real thoughts are and like your emotions. And and so during that time, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. Sheesh. So I was 
at work all the time. I hated my schedule, but I also am not a failure. And so that's not in my vocabulary. And so I knew that whenever I get off of this and this is done and my program is stable, I'm leaving. I knew I was leaving. I had already made my mind up. I told my mom. Leaving youth villages. Yes, this is it. Like, I have, like, this is a lot, you know? So I'm managing my staff. I'm managing my supervisors. Like, you're trying to get them. They're new. They're really green. I'm green to this program. It was just, it was very much so overwhelming. And once I finally got my bearings, we had a conversation with my, which was my current supervisor at the time. and. I was like, when am I going to, like, get off of this? Like, I'm doing good. Like, I'm doing well. Like, it's it's working. And she asked me, she said, what's your plan? And I was like, oh, I'm doing my plan. I don't know. <laughs> and so I was like, I don't know. I said that in my head. I was like, I'm doing my plan. But I was like, you know, can you tell me what you mean? What's your plan? Because we can't do this again. And I was like, yeah, I guess you're right. I was like, I don't know. She was like, well, get back with me. So it took me a week to come up with a plan. What am I going to do? So I had to think about what I did differently. What did I do differently? Did I do anything differently? Was I just working because I was there and, you know, impacting and it just stopped? Did I implement new processes? Like, what did I do different to make this what it needed to be? And so I was like, I did do things. Okay. So I went, I did things, wrote it down. And I went back to her office. I said, hey, I did this. I did this. I did this. These things worked. I changed this. This is now where I'm thinking or how I'm thinking and where my brain is. And the worst probably developmental strategy ever. (laughs) But it worked for me. And she managed me for me. Not for anybody else. Not this was for me. She knew how to, I guess, impact me. And so... To go through all of that for 45 days just to then have to take a beat and to deal with my mom having breast cancer was overwhelming. My sister does not like blood or, like, she doesn't like any of those things. Hindsight, I'm an OT, which is pretty normal, didn't bother me. So got done with that for 45 days, but then cried probably every day after because I'm like, is my mom going to die? Like, I did all of this to get out just to essentially— you know, deal with her. So right, it never mom, stops. My mom is great. Thank she, God. She made a full recovery. <laughs> full recovery and awesome. remission for probably about five years, which is pretty awesome. But that piece of resiliency, I almost think that nothing can really. I don't want to say break me, but I have a tough skin. And so you're saying if somebody was not resilient, they would have quit for so sure. So it became a personal issue for you, mm-hmm. where it didn't matter what was going on externally. Because of who you are as a person, you're like, I am going to see this through. I'm going to see it through. And that made you dig deeper Mm -hmm. than just for the organization itself. And then as a result, you didn't quit. You got through it. Mm -hmm. But then how you were led and how you were encouraged to assess, you got to see how you were able to get things where they needed to be. I can train anybody. (laughs) Because when you, you have to change your perspective, like you have to change how you're looking at it. And I really, she's really clever. It was a professional intent because the goal was for me to manage my programs. But I also think that it turned out to be like a life lesson. Like poor preparation leaves you in a bad spot. And if you're just reacting and responding to the things that life hits you, you know, like granted, you can't control everything, but if you can at least put your best foot forward before anything happens, you're probably going to be able to be okay and to, you know, sustain. And so it wasn't, that was the lesson for the program, but I think that's something that carries all of us through. Like, what are you doing to be proactive? Are you planning? Are you preparing for things? So that in the event that something happens, you're not having a knee-jerk reaction. It's, okay, let me take a beat. Let's assess. Let's move forward versus freaking out. What does it feel like for you right now at this stage of your career? to use your skill sets, your education, your training to help kids? It makes me happy, actually. (laughs) Like, some days, I'm like, man, he got it. Like, that was a great session. Or, and sometimes it may not even be me. Sometimes, like, me directly. So, in a session, it may be, you know, me directly. But sometimes it may be me coaching a staff in the moment and saying, like, hey, try this, try this, try this. 
and then see them get the win because now they have a better rapport with the kid and now they're able to influence them better. So that's probably what keeps me here. If Like now in this stage of my life is just seeing how, one, I directly impact my caseload, but then two. Developing people. Yeah, developing people. What I do you want for your own career? It's a loaded question. A year ago, I would have told you that I 100% want to bridge as an OT, as an occupational therapy therapist. Bridge. Meaning go from, so the reason why I went the certified OTA, occupational therapy assistant route, is because I I have a whole life. <laughs> and going back to occupational therapy school would have required me to stop working and just go to school. My life isn't built like that. My life is built with a mortgage and a car note and all the things, right? You're in it. Yeah, I'm here. I'm right. like I'm I have You can't a, hit the pause button. Right. <laughs> and so going back to OTA school, I got to actually do school at night. And again, going back to why this is a family. I worked during the day. I went to school at night. I did that for about a year and a half. My last 6 months, I did my clinicals during the day and I worked at night. There's nowhere that I could think about that allows you to have that much flexibility in your schedule. An opportunity. Just to go to school, right? And not saying that people wouldn't, but I literally flopped my schedule within two years, and they were okay with it. Everybody is on board. And so I went to, and that's why I went that route, is so that I, I needed to still work. I still needed to live and be able to pay for me to live. And so... I became an OTA. They have a bridge program, meaning you can transition from being an assistant to an actual OT therapist. And so that's kind of, that has always been my end goal. I just needed to do it in a smart way to where I can still financially like afford to live. And you were able to do that All in here. here, which is wild. Never missed a beat. If I needed to not come to work because I was super ex- exhausted, I really need to sleep. <laughs> I've been up for almost probably 20 hours. I went to school, came to work, and been going, going, going. I please just have today off. Yep. Because they knew that when they got me, they got me. I was giving 100% every single time. When it came to getting staff in here, there was not a, like, I was probably the fastest RC turning over staff and getting them hired, all while going to school. And so... If I can be at the top of my game to perform for them, I'm really cool with the flexibility that they gave me. So I had no problem, you know, performing or doing what I needed to do. But a year ago, I would have said I wanted to bridge and be an OT. Do I want to stop doing OT? For sure, no. I have just started. I'm ready to dive face first into it. But I'm not sure if I want to bridge quite yet. I think I kind of want to just sink into the profession, learn, grow. And kind of see where life takes me. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. What opportunity do you see now that Youth Villages has a tuition reimbursement program? So we've always had this program. So and I advocate for it because I do believe that if you want to go, then money isn't an option anymore, especially once you are here. And so that is definitely one of the pieces that we advertise when we are recruiting our staff members. And so you I think you you may know this, but we hired non durried staff as well. And so a lot of them, oh, I want to go back to school. Hey, let's let's tap into this. Like, let's see what that looks like for you. And so tuition reimbursement has licensed a lot of our clinicians. A lot of our night monitors have transitioned to counselors. A lot of our night monitors have transitioned to t- direct care or to being program managers. So you've seen a lot of our staff members take advantage of tuition reimbursement. You think reimbursement. people realize help? Special that opportunity is. So I think some do, but I think, you know, again, I think it's how you think about things and how you adjust your mindset. And so a lot of people may say, well, I have to pay the money first, go to school, make the grade. And so instead of, and I think that's surface level level of thinking. If you're like, oh, you know, I have to give that money right now. But if you think of it as an investment, we're going to invest in you. So one, we want to see if you're in it. And so I, and. If you were to ask me, hey, Whitney, I need, you know, $1,000, I would say, okay, Sam, I need you to show me that you're worth this $1,000, right? And so I think that it's fair to say, 
hey, make the grade. We need you to make a B, you know, and above. We'll get, you know, pay you to be, you know, for that class. So we're saying if you invest in yourself, we'll turn and return invest back in you. Once you get done that tuition reimbursement, we've invested in you. We invested in your professional development, your education. Hey, give us a little bit back. Like twofold. It's a collaboration of a relationship. So some people may not see it as that, but I guess once you really know like that's what you want, you should take advantage of it. Last question I got. Mm-hmm. What do you want most for youth villages in the future? Hmm. To continue to give people like me an opportunity. To have the ride that you've had and want to continue to have. Mm-hmm. But I'm really proud of our organization. There are there have been a lot of qualified people that have had missed opportunities for the sake of education. But I don't always think that education is a degree. I think you can be highly educated, smart, intelligent, savvy, professional. I think all of those qualities doesn't account for a piece of paper. I I do believe it's your choice, but you can have someone come in 21 years old, be with this organization, and know every policy procedure in, out, can develop anybody in a blink. But for the sake of them not having an education, they couldn't move up. And you're saying they get that here? Yes. So Youth Villages has, we have changed that, and they are able to lead and to continue to grow. So that would have been my wish. So I'm just proud of them. Like, I'm proud of us for us to identify that we have value in people regardless of their educational status. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. How was this? It was cool. I do really like talking about, like, my story. So people only hear Youth Villages. Oh, you work with those bad kids? (laughs) And it's more to it. Like, most of, almost all of our kids, they're not bad. They have a lot of things that are going on. They have a lot of negative influences. They have a lot of negative environmental influences. If you lived on a block where everybody around you carried a pistol, sold drugs, your house is run down, you literally sell drugs to keep your lights on, or your parent, mom, dad, sister, brother has molested you, raped you, prostitutes you out, like, Those are our kids. Those are some of our kids. Those are a lot of our kids. And so what would you do if that was you? How would you survive if your mom would rather have crack than you? How would you survive if everybody around you is gang affiliated? And if you don't, they're going to kill you anyways. You know? So perspective. I hope I would be like, some of the people I've talked to. Yep. So it's not just that kid's bad. Maybe they did something bad. Yeah, they did. But who influenced them? Why are they bad? Yeah. So. Thank you. You're welcome. This has been awesome, and it's a privilege to be with you. From Youth Villages, I'd like to say thank you for listening to this episode of Stronger Than You Think. And thank you, Whitney Malone, for sharing your story with us. For more information about careers with Youth Villages, visit www.youthvillages.org. That's youthvillages.org. We have also included resources in the show notes where you can find out more information about our programs. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to support the show, the best thing you can do is recommend it to a friend. Maybe share it with someone who you think might need it right now or is looking for their next career move. On behalf of Youth Villages, my name is Sam Coates, and I'm reminding you that you are stronger than you think. Before we go, here's a sneak peek at what's to come on our next episode with Youth Villages' own Dennis McBee. We'll see you back here then. No, there were multiple attempts. There were a total of three. What do you wish somebody told you then that you know now? It was just having somebody there to let me know I wasn't alone because I really felt alone at that time. You know, after losing mom, and I was I was a true uh, uh, mama's boy, so I was just in in every stretch of that imagination of being that I was that. And when she was lost, I felt so alone. 